to something outside themselves. Now, I'm going to say more about that later, but let me just go ahead and make this point, because this is where so many people have last time and ask a very good question. What, what do you mean by uh, uh, what I said last time? That, that this Roman was expressing something moral. I know that's confusing to a lot of people. But in the sociology of religion, we make a distinction. We're not talking a lot about religion this semester, but let me go ahead and make this one distinction. We talk about the distinction between the sacred and the profane. <coughs> now, uh, sacred, S-A-C-E-R-D, sacred, profane, P-R-O-F-A-N-E. The sacred versus the profane, the contrast between two different spheres. And in sociology, this does not mean religion. The, 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 the difference between the sacred and the profane is, is not synonymous with religion. It has to do with a sphere of life. The sacred is a time set apart, a special time. That's what it means in sociology. A time that, that is given a special identity where different things occur. That's what it means to, to have a sacred gathering. Uh, there, there, there's oftentimes a religious motivation. Church on Sunday is a time set apart. You know, that is a special time. Uh, Christmas, Easter, Different holidays are set, set apart as sacred, you can call them holy if you like, sacred, holy gatherings that have some kind of a special meaning. And they are different from ordinary, everyday life. Now this is where I'm headed. Mardi Gras is one of those times. It's set apart. It's given a holiday. The holiday is even based on the Catholic Church. Oh, no. I really didn't get that, but I will never get a phone call in the middle of class. That's a, gen that's a general from the uh, uh, military service. Uh, it's, it's a time set apart. So the sacred gathering that is represented in this case by Marty <coughs> is distinct from the ordinary, everyday period. And that's what we kind of want to focus on today. Now, this is where I want you to concentrate your attention for a second. All different societies, some of them are hunters and gathering, gatherers roaming around in the savannah, some of them are agriculturalists. Our modern industrial society is a different type. I want to mention two differences, and only two, of the vast majority many, many, many differences that there are. Because these are the ones that are really relevant to Mardi Gras and the ritual disrobement practice. Strangers. Focus on strangers for a second. It's impossible for us to, to go back to even envision a period. It's impossible for you sitting in this room to envision a period in which there were no strangers. where strangers were not a part of your everyday life. And we're sitting in a room where I don't know most of you, and most of you don't know most of each other. It's totally comfortable for us. We're used to it. For most societies, for most human history, the existence of a stranger <coughs> was weird. They spent all of their waking hours and all of their sleeping hours was like that. In the presence of people they knew. The fact is, what, one of the things that is really different about modern society, it's just one of those differences that you can't hardly, you can't hardly imagine because it's not, we, don't, we live here, is that <laughs> we are comfortable and we have a routine for dealing with strangers. We know how, we know strangers are usually not a threat, we know we usually don't have things to fear from them. And we are perfectly happy being with strangers as long as we don't get those signals that they are. 
Okay? It doesn't mean that they are sometimes, but we can deal with strangers. And that is one of the things that really is a difference between modern society and all other pre-modern forms. Pre-modern societies, strangers, people you didn't know, were not around. Most of the time. And if you did, as one of my old professors used to say, there are only two ways of dealing with a stranger. You either beat them or eat them. In other words, you either have a celebration and a party and welcome them, or you put them in a pot and um, The second thing, and this is the big one today, is a market economy. <coughs> we have a different economy than three modern forms. We do not barter. We do not trade one item for another when we want it. We actually have a very developed system for exchanging for what we want. And we'll come back to that. In a market society, and this is where we're really getting into the moral aspect of virtual disrobing. In a market society like ours, we participate in a situation where we buy goods and services for money. That's the essence of the market. That there is a freedom to choose. And this is fundamental to every conservative community that has ever been developed. A freedom to choose whether to buy something, whether to hand over your cash to a seller, or not to buy something. Whether to say, hey, it's too expensive, or hey, there's a better product, or no, I don't want what you sell. A freedom of choice in saying yes or no to an offer. By the same token, uh, for, the, for the seller, you know, we usually think of the market as being something in which you have a choice. We want people to be free to provide their services. We want people to be free to produce a certain good, to produce a different type of apple that's better than the old type, or a different type of car that's sexier and faster than the old type. And we want, them to get, we want that freedom for both the buyers and the sellers, and we would like to have some way for buyers and sellers to get together. Okay, now in this case, uh, in this case, we talk about a generalized medium in order for the buyers and sellers to get together. Generalized medium is money. Generalized medium is currency. It's something that you can, that, that is standardized, that you can spin to buy what you want. Okay? Now, I use this term, generalized medium, which is a fancy, <coughs> it's a fancy term, but I use it because I don't really want to spend money. I want to use a broader term. A generalized medium is just anything that we decide could have more or less value. As long as we all agree that this is the thing that has value. You know, there's a big debate now among economists about the gold standard. Should we go back to the gold standard? You know, let's uh, we, we don't need we gold. Gold's heavy to carry around. We just, we just agree that dollar bills and pins and twitties are all worth something. And so when I get ready to buy my coffee at Starbucks, then I'm going to hand it over and they're going to give me the coffee. We all agree. Money is a generalized term. <coughs> now, and I think that you can start to see where I'm going to go with this, is if we wanted to, we could decide that something else would be that currency, right? It wouldn't have to be paper dollars bills. It could be <coughs> these. Now, this is the most important part of the theory, and I'll take this several times. We're, this is what we're getting to, but I want to you know, make sure you know in advance. What we have, and the reason that I say that this is an aspect of, of moral commitment, we have a very 
strong faith in this country, in the United States of America. We have a very strong faith in the free market. And maybe this used to be even clearer during the time when the United States and its great adversary, the Soviet Union, were kind of you know, the two major superpowers before the Soviet Union collapsed. And they were communists, and we were capitalists, and the difference was our way, speaking from the American perspective, our way was better than and superior to their way. And why? Because our way was based on the market, was based on a way that gave people freedom, which allowed people to buy and sell what they want. And that would be ultimately more productive, and it would lead to better things. And that was our belief. We were morally committed to it. We felt that the free market was right, it was natural, and it was good. And that is what we mean by a moral commitment to the market. We felt that it was best. Now, we are going to see today how our commitment is embodied in ritual. And this is coming back to my point that, that ritual is not just about doing certain things. It can be about something else. Now, I'm going to get to this in two steps. The first is by talking about something that happened before this road. And this is uh, this kind of... Uh, I understand people disagree with this next statement. Barney Brothers is not a Catholic holiday. It's not a pagan holiday. It's not a colonial holiday. Most people don't think it's Cajun. Most people recognize that Cajun Mardi Gras is different from New Orleans Mardi Gras. In New Orleans, Mardi Gras is its own thing. I mean, some people like to say, oh, it goes back to pagan times. Well, you know, just because you have a party and wear certain things doesn't mean your party is a pagan, a pagan ritual or something like that. And Mardi Gras in New Orleans originated in the 19th century. It originated at a very specific time. People know who the first crew was, what they were doing. There's a lot of history. Uh, I can't remember right at the time, but it seems like it was like around 1850. But uh, she might know. The crew of Columbus. Uh, the crew of Columbus. Right? I think so. Rex was right around then, but I don't think it was the first. Um, the original crews, they didn't have floats. Obviously, they didn't have trucks. They didn't have drivable vehicles. And horses, and they would go down the street, and they were, uh, it was actually invented in the American part of the city, from what I've been told, where the American part of the city went down to visit the French Quarter, and they kind of broke down and, and had a big uh, had a big parade, and people lit torches, and they, they did throw things, but when you read the old descriptions of the things that they threw, some of them are not very pleasant. These people, for one, but they, that, that was, you know, kind of, Nasty, but people were in this business of kind of like throwing things. When they would make nice medallions and stuff, they would hand them usually to people that they knew. And the, the people who were doing the riding were white, they were men, and they were rich. They lived in the big houses of town and world. Marty Brown grew pretty quickly, but this was the kind of people that populated the early Mardi Gras. And now we can identify what was then the main ritual paradigm of Mardi Gras. And was up until, well, I mean, it still is, it still is there. The main ritual paradigm was. Okay, sorry. You can write that down first. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. It's a command paradigm. Okay? Okay. Let me put it on the wrong slide. But this is what it is. This is a command paradigm. 
deal in the land deed, the command paradigm. I take that term from, from economics because it represents a certain type of society. The command paradigm represents a rural type of society, rural R-U-R-A-L. A society based on agriculture. Now, how many, okay, how many people, everybody has seen this, am I right or not? Everybody seen this? Everybody knows what I'm talking about. You saw it in the, uh, in the movie on Tuesday. If you haven't personally seen it, you're in for a great treat. And you can go and get some beads. But the basic deal is that, and this is, if you can go to Baton Rouge or, or Lafayette <coughs> or Lake Charles, you, you can go in almost any city in Louisiana and, just, and see this. The command paradigm is one in which people get up on trucks and, or, or they're pulled by trucks, and they have a nice float, and it's very elaborate, and people who are masked, uh, it's actually, you have to be masked in New Orleans, you know, sometimes people violate that rule. They represent themselves as aristocrats. They dress as dukes, kings, they don't only do that anymore, but that was the origin. They dress as members of a high social class. Now, what are they doing? Mainly what they're doing is riding down the street and throwing stuff. And mainly what people do is raise up their hands and scream and shout and say in the traditional fashion, Hey, mister, throw me something. Thank you. Throw me something, Mr. Hey, Mr. Throw me something. Okay, well, I should be Mr. You don't know who they But that's the, that's the, that's the old-fashioned way. Throw me something, Mr. Okay, now, the fact is, this, you don't have to be, now, I mean, obviously, not everybody gets it, but you don't have to be some very, kind of very sophisticated sociologist to figure out what that would symbolize, if it symbolized something. Okay, this is the 19th century. It's the 19th century, before we had a fully industrialized society, most of the people in Louisiana were living in the country, they weren't living in the city. They lived on plantations, they lived on farms. Most people during that era were farmers, somehow living off the land. Not necessarily the people who were riding on the floats, but they probably owned land somewhere. What does that symbolize when you have vast aristocrats riding down the street on a float, throwing something freely down into a mass of beggars? It symbolized actually what it was. That there were two classes, an upper class and a lower class. And the lower class of peasants or beggars, or whatever you want to call them, raising their hands and saying, give me something, were separating themselves out from those, that class of people who got to ride on the foot. Now, you know, if you go down to the city of Louisiana, you're going to see that, and that's going to be a, a big part of Mardi Gras, it still is, but something changed. By the way, uh, it wasn't an extra credit, but did anybody do it? Did anybody ask anybody who did it start? Who did you just start? Raise your hand if you have an idea. I think I actually posted, well, it might be in the paper that I posted. I put up a paper um, on the website, which is the second, the, the no numbers paper, if you want to read more about it. And it's probably in that. <coughs> what emerged was a different paradigm. And the question that I was kind of obsessed with for a while is when did this happen? When I first got here in 1982, fall of 1982, and I, I first went to my Mardi Gras, my first Mardi Gras in the spring of 83, and we saw people disrobing, me and my friends, we saw people disrobing and, you know, it wasn't too long after that, I, I would just ask people, like, 
this is pretty strange behavior. When did this, how long has this been going on? And the one answer that I always received from everybody was, it's been going on forever. It's always going on. It's always going to be Marty Rock. It's always going on. And it wasn't until later, when I started to try to really figure it out, that I heard it. it had just been invented. It had just been invented in the sh few short years before I came here. And it was already so well established. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. So well established that people could say, this thing going on forever. Just like it was always a part of Mardi Gras. Now that's when you know you've created a new tradition. That's when you know people are claiming, well, we've always done this, and they just invented it. You know, I mean, people do this in small social groups, too. This is just the way we do things. Like it stays going on forever. <coughs> it doesn't really have to have gone on that long for a year tradition, but this was just a very popular one. Now, what was the French Quarter, and what was New Orleans prior to this period of time? New Orleans always marketed itself very well. New Orleans always kind of knew what it was good for, which was the I mean, it's good for shipping the Mississippi River and stuff too. But even in the 19th century, New Orleans started marketing itself as the city that cared for God, as a, as a, they didn't have to turn to Big Easy, but it, New Orleans always knew we can get a lot of money from tourists if we just show ourselves in the right light. So tourism, and visitors from outside have always been part of the New Orleans economy. And in order to facilitate that or to make that interesting, they've always put forward an, an image of a kind of romance, and partying, and good food, and good times. Forget about your cares. Come to New Orleans and enjoy. It was the original Las Vegas. Um, there was a, uh, if you want to see a really uh, outstanding movie um, of the earlier era of New Orleans, it's probably pretty big. It's pretty big. Uh, with Brooke Shields and uh, David Carradine, fabulous movies about kind of 19th century brothels in New Orleans. And they had this very famous um, area uh, called Storyville, which was a uh, house of prostitution. But they also had in the 1950s, a very kind of developed industry of burlesque clubs. Uh, actually, another good movie uh, in this day is Paul Newman, was called The Lake. And it was about the affair that our governor, Earl K. Long, had with a stripper uh, down in French Quarter, which he was very public about. Everybody knew it. And her name was Blaze Star. Now, th this is kind of when the men's club started coming up in. Uh, in the late, um, the late 2000s. It's kind of a resurgence of that 1950s stuff. Now, I wanted to mention another movie in this, in this vein. I've got about four movies for you this, this, uh, this lecture. Uh, Easy Rider. How many of you have ever seen Easy Rider? Put it in your Netflix clip queue for a 1960s movie. It was about the counterculture. It was about drugs and actually Peter Fonda and uh, Dennis Hopper come down to New Orleans and they sell drugs and Jack Nicholson's in it. And they come down to New Orleans and they come to Mardi Gras. And there's scenes in it of you know, drug use and Mardi Gras and you see all this stuff. And so this was a very big instigation for hippies and counterculture types to come down to New Orleans and to see this as a place, like a real destination, a place to go. So that was all happening. Um, New Orleans was also a place that was very gay friendly. Back in, it, wasn't, it wasn't explicit, but let's put it this way, there were a lot of gays in the French Quarter area. <coughs> what there wasn't was ritual disrobement. Disrobement is not nudity. There was nudity in Easy Rider. People actually drop acid and take off their clothes and run around naked in the cemetery. That's one of the scenes of the movie. It seemed fun, other people came and did the same thing. Ritual disrobement is something different. It's a repetitive action, 
it occurs time and time again, that is recognized by the participants as meaningful. People in the 70s, and this is when it started, people in the 1970s came down to New Orleans to party. New Orleans people always party, you know, to a certain degree, but, you know, when you live in a place, you're not partying as hard as when you come to a place specifically for that purpose. And what I, I was kind of implying last Tuesday, people from Iowa have always come down, got drunk, and taken their clothes off because they were too much to drink. But that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about a particular form that was at the, at the beginning of the deviant that occurred only in a particular time and a particular place. Uh, I'm going to come back to this so please don't write it down. Okay. I'm going to give you a date. I don't know if it's exact date, but I'm going to say 1975 or 1976. I've never been able to turn it down further. And the best, one of the, one of the points of evidence here, it's another movie whose name I forget because it's, probably, it's among the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a movie about a serial killer in New Orleans that appeared in just about 1975, 1976. And the date is very important. Because this is an early slash. And, and this movie, I, I'm, I don't really even know the name, so there's no point in my trying to think of it. it. It's a movie about a guy, the killer, dresses himself up as an Aztec warrior and drugs women who he strips and then pulls out their heart on a table while they're lying naked on a table. Okay, now, whether or not you like movies like that, I can tell you this is a bad movie. It's, it's really bad. Okay, so what happens is they, are, they have a lot of scenes of Mardi Gras, and the reason I think this is relevant is because it's when the movie came out. It came out exactly this time this is a movie that is using every single opportunity that they can to show naked people. All, and, and gratuitous nakedness, where you don't even need it, it doesn't even fit the problem, okay? Every opportunity they can, and there is not a single shot, even among the numerous shots that they shoot in balconies in New Orleans, and the street during Mardi Gras, not a single shot of anybody being naked at all. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, what does this movie make? Because this is a movie that's trying to shoot, because it was obviously a very low budget, they had to get it you know, where they could. And they, they, were, they were not able to shoot it, because it didn't exist when they were filming, which would have been one or two years earlier. So that's part of my evidence. But another of my evidence is I've done interviews with people who claim to have been. All right? Um, in the mid-70s in the world, what you did see on balconies, but people sometimes drop their pants, okay? And what we did see in this particular set, set of interviews, look, 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 look. I, don't have any, I, I don't have any good quotes for you today, but I'll, I'll just remember. What we did see was a group of people, this is verifiable, a group of people on Royal Street. Now, if you don't know the French Quarter, Bourbon Street is one block off of Royal Street. And this was a group of Judas. And I, I hooked up with this guy because he was a, an artist on Jackson Square, and he did portraits. He was one of these guys that did people, people, uh, visual, visual artworks. And uh, I discovered that he had been involved in it, so we did an interview with him and his wife. And they had a, uh, I think I even had the address of the, the street address of the place. In the paper, they, they were a group of nudists. When I say nudists, I mean they were practicing the lifestyle of, of nudism. And, you know, 
they would go to the beaches and they would take all their clothes off and they were just doing this. You know? So they would have a party every year and it was on Boyle Street, on a second floor apartment. And at this party, they would be naked inside the, inside the, the, uh, the house. And because they were doing this, that wasn't really a big deal, and that was just their lifestyle. So they're in the house, and one year, somebody gets an idea. I believe that it was a woman. And some of you laughed when you saw that little sign in the movie last Tuesday. You remember at one point you see a woman on a balcony holding a sign, and then she turns it upside down? You remember that? And it says, show your, and there's a little icon of the penis on it. She goes, she's smiling, and she goes like this, and she goes back. That's actually what happened. That, that wasn't the shot of it, because that wasn't shot until many, many years later. But this woman went outside, she made up a sign, said, show your dick. <clears throat> she was clothed. Her friend, who was not her husband, who was married to someone else, but it was just her friend. And he, he was dressed as a clown. He had a clown out there. This is the guy that I interviewed. And his wife was there to interview with him. She also verified this story. <coughs> they would go out and they would say, look, you guys show yours and she'll show hers. Meaning her breasts. And so, so they, they would, uh, he would, the, the clown would try to recruit guys walking down the street and he would say, hey, hey, you guys, listen here, listen here. You guys show your stuff and she'll show her, her stuff. And they would say, no, 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 you're lying. Come on, that's not true. And he goes, no, no, seriously, seriously, I, I swear she will. And so the first known picture of Mardi Gras nudity, I'm really sorry I don't have a copy, but I, I, I feel, you know, that was, I didn't have a scan of what I was I should have done. It's a picture of four guys, I think it's four guys, it's a lot of guys, all with their trousers down from 1976, all with their trousers down to about here. The, the really peculiar thing is they're all looking at themselves and not, not the balcony. But you can tell that there's something going on at the balcony because there's someone back in back of them taking a photograph. This kind of verifies there's something interesting on the balcony. Otherwise, why wouldn't the photographer be taking them? The, back, the photographer is taking the balcony. So what this means is this is not ritual disorder. This has nothing to do with the exchange of nudity for peace. This is nudity for nudity. This is like the little kids game. You show yours and I'll show mine. This doesn't have to do with you. They invented something that was meaningful to them, right? Because they were nudists. They thought it would be fun to see other people get naked. Because they want to do this. In other words, regular people will, for once in their lifetime, do something that we're doing. You know, they'll see it's not so bad, and anyway, it'll be funny to see them taking their clothes off because they're so shy about it, and, you know, they, it'll just be funny. So that's what they thought. Well, is that the ritual that they have today? No. How many people have seen nudity for nudity in the world? Occasionally, you do still see them. Very, very rarely, not 1% of the time, far less, like 1,000% of the time. Um, I'll give you a good one. This is, this is a good one. When I was uh, finishing one of the verses of the paper, we were up on the balcony. And we were not filming, but we were just uh, observing or having a drink or something like that. Two Hispanic women come up to the balcony. This would be about 10 years ago. Two Hispanic women come up to the balcony, and they're, you know, very sort of active, and they're, you know, they're all partying and stuff. So uh, some guys come down uh, the street, and the two women go, uh, the, the guys say, you know, show your stuff, and, and they're flirting, and say, no, 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 no we're not going to do that. And they, and they say, you, you show us your stuff. So, so the guys, pull their pants down, the two women take their beads, throw them down to the street for the guys that it's just showed, and then the guys shout and say, okay, okay, now you show your stuff. And so the two women expose themselves, and the guys throw back the same beads. The same beads. 
Now, think about this sociologically. Why didn't it catch up? Why didn't it catch up? If you want to get naked, you can just get naked. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do this. If you wanted to do an exchange and you wanted to get naked, why don't you just get naked and then the other person could get naked and you could save yourself a piece? No. That didn't work. That didn't catch on. Nobody was interested in doing that. What they were interested in was the exchange of nudity for tea. And so the same group of people said, and this is almost a direct quote from the interview, they said, well, you know, we just thought sometimes, you know, the grades were bad, or maybe it was raining and you didn't get your beads, and so we just thought, well, let's just see if they'll take their clothes off for the beads. And so we saw some people coming down the street, and we said, uh, you know, show us your stuff for your beads, and they said, okay, and so we just started doing that, and then, well, there wasn't any point in or the other. So why don't we just do that? And they describe something that's very, very similar to what I gave you earlier in class. They describe something where a middle-aged couple walks down the street and the people on the balcony are saying uh, to the woman, you know, would you show your show your stuff? And, and then the woman turns to her husband and looks at him and goes, honey, it's okay. And the husband says, yeah, go ahead, that's fine. And so she does, and she's, and the, and the quote from the guy was, she was so proud to be free, or to you know, do that kind of thing. And since he was a nudist, that was what he liked. He was like the fact that you know, she was willing to do it too. So, what we observe, and this is from the study itself, is the third feature that I, the third feature of my outline, that I started with. The variation. What we observed when we started filming, we had four cameras, all uh, operated by LSU students, and we had locations on the balcony and on the street, and they were filmed some hours at night and some hours during the day. And what we found at that time, it's not so true anymore, is that this behavior was very concentrated on Bourbon Street. In fact, in the early days, in this case of the nudists, they were actually on Royal Street. One of the things they wanted to do was to get people to stop and linger, to sort of to party with them and not go to Bourbon Street, to, to stay here for a while. You don't, don't need to walk to Bourbon Street, it's fun here too. That was one of their but when we actually studied it, we found that almost all of the disrobement was on, on Bourbon Street. It was go one block off and you see it. I want you to remember these, there's going to be three all together, <coughs> but I want you to remember the names of the paradigm. The first is the one that we've already talked about, with, when the mass people come down the street and they throw these off of the floats. And that's the command paradigm. But the essence of it is not that they're riding on a float. The essence of it is that they are standing up top and they give away the beans for free. They're just throwing. Yeah. The second paradigm is the market paradigm. And this we've already discussed. The market paradigm is the exchange of beads for nudity. That's the essence of this rope. There's a third paradigm that I'm going to give to you next time, but I want to give you the extra credit. Um, So, I think we're going to do the extra credit, but I want to make this final point because you notice that 
even though we talked about it last time, and we still do the last time, do you notice about this lecture that I haven't talked about, we haven't talked about women, but not much. Do you notice I haven't, haven't really talked about gender, except when I'm talking about marriage? This is the thing that people do not sufficiently appreciate. 